Andy, man, thank you so much for coming on the show here today. Super excited to have you on. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah. I mean, if we start kind of who I am, uh, I'm a father. Um, that's, you know, first and foremost. I've got a 27-year-old daughter. I've got a 9-year-old daughter. Uh, I'm also a grandfather. <laughs> so I have yeah. three grandkids at the ripe age of uh, 44 years old. Um, go. I'm a son. I got two great parents. I'm a brother. I got an awesome sister. I'm a husband uh, to my wife. And then uh, I own a gym. And uh, I identify from a, uh, I identify as a coach. Like that's, that's who I am. That summarizes what I do in a lot of areas of my life. Yeah, I love it, man. And obviously, you've been on the show a few times. If you are new to Andy's world, I will make sure I link those in the show notes so you can find them. But, dude, what's new since the last time we chatted? Because it's been a hot minute. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what's new in my world? Um, a lot of growth here at the location in Madison um, and continuing to empower people to own their roles in here uh, as opposed to me driving and dictating a lot of that. Uh, I'm really moving into kind of a pure visionary role to focus on expanding into some other areas in our community. Um, we do have uh, an opportunity, like I mentioned to you, ironically, uh, after this podcast, I'm going to look at a building in another location. Um, you know, I don't think you can jinx that. I don't really believe in it. <laughs> the math will either math or it won't. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that that's where I'm at right now, looking at doing another facility and uh, possibly doing a couple more. That's awesome, man. When are you going to move into the coffee game? That's what I really want to know. Like, Honest Coffee, is that the, the spot down there? I'll tell you what's the spot. Well, Honest is the spot here. You, you, okay. You've been to Honest. It, it's yeah. the spot. I do think that's the best. Um, but recently, I just got put on, for all of the coffee lovers, the brand Fellow. Are you familiar with that? Don't think so. Fellow. Okay, they make Fellow. really good coffee shop quality grinders, uh, okay. pour overs that are, rel that are affordable. So here recently, I invested in the the fellow setup. I got a good grinder, a good scale, okay. a good you know, all that good stuff. And uh, the brand of coffee that I'm just in love with right now is called Onyx. Okay. Um, yeah, Onyx has some of the best coffee options um, available, and it's a it's a great brand. Anybody that's really into coffee, they, they might know about it. Yeah, uh, they would certainly appreciate it. Okay. One of my favorite memories of you is we were touring Indy one time looking at different breakfast spots and coffee spots and we walked into one and you're like nope what do you mean no he's like no i can tell by the the coffee Machine. maker <laughs> yeah. the next one we go into and you're just like yep that's it that's the one <laughs> <laughs> sure enough it was the best coffee we had that weekend yep. so yep. that's yep. awesome man well so one thing that i'm kind of focusing on with people like you is the journey that you've gone through in your career because i think a lot of the young trainers young coaches they get caught up in the flash, you get caught up in the sizzle, the IG, the TikTok. So what I really want to do today with you, Andy, is just take like a deep dive into your coaching career, your evolution. And let's start base level. Like what got you started in coaching in the first place? I, I think lifting in sports, like a lot of us, right? Like it started yep. there for me lifting uh, in high school. I, uh, I was a real knucklehead uh, when I was younger and I ended up uh, having to go to three different high schools because of that. And ironic, you know, this is in the early 90s. And yeah. um, I graduated in 97. Okay. And uh, so my freshman year, I went to DeMatha High School, uh, which if you're in the sports world, you might know about it. They were number one in the country in basketball, number three in the country in football. I was recruited to go there because I was a pretty good athlete, uh, but couldn't really keep my head together or my attitude. And uh, that was rather <laughs> short-lived. But Big Mike was my strength coach there. And he was a real strength coach. And uh, after that, I ended up going to Westlake High School. And I had a strength coach named Coach K, Coach Paul Kowalicek, who is the epitome of a strength coach. He wore the coach's shorts. Oh, yeah. Uh, he literally used to eat raw potatoes in the morning just to kind of like show you that he was <laughs> tougher than you. And uh, he, he was an absolute animal. You'd come into school early and he'd be in a full sweat. He had already got a workout in and yep. he lived it, man. And then uh, the third high school, after some things at Westlake, uh, I had a guy named David Bradshaw, and uh, he was a real strength coach too, man. Like we lifted hard, we lifted heavy. Uh, there was very much in the powerlifting days, and because I was pretty damn strong, I had a connection to Mark Chalet, Chalet's powerhouse in uh, Marlow Heights, Maryland. So anybody that's into powerlifting will probably know Mark's name. He was a really big guy in the powerlifting community, yep. and uh, powerlifting was, you know, my first kind of entrance into things. 
from a strength standpoint. And honestly, at that stage of my life, I was really just trying not to, you know, go to prison. I mean, that was kind of the goal. Like, let's avoid <laughs> going to jail because I was just, I, what do they say now? They say I was outside. <laughs> I, I was outside, outside. Um, and, but I always lifted. That was always a thing, um, despite being a knucklehead. And I was at a Gold's gym uh, one day, and this guy walked in with the uh, Redskins, old Redskins receiver, Alvin Harper, also played for mm. the Cowboys. And they were walking through the gym, and I, I was like, man, this guy's somebody. Like, I don't, like, I can tell he's somebody. He's walking with Alvin, you know, the owner talked to him. So I just, something told me to go talk to him. And I went up and I talked to him, and I said, hey, man, I'm, I'm Andy. I'm, you know, I'm really into lifting and stuff. Like, who are you? You know, I don't, yeah. I don't remember how I opened that door, but he was like, hey, man, I'm Eric, and I'm, uh, I'm here to look at an opportunity of putting a personal training company uh, inside this Gold's Gym. And uh, I don't know why I just, I was like, oh, I've always wanted to be a personal trainer. I, I had considered it, but it wasn't like it was my life's dream, right? Right, yeah. Um, he was like, really? And uh, and I just kind of blurted out all the things I was dealing with in my life. Hey, man, I had a kid who's 16 years old. I'm living on my own. I live in a project now uh, in Indian Head. You know, I'm, I'm just really trying to find my way in the world. And and he was like, look, if you're open to it, meet me in Roslyn, Virginia uh, at Gold's Gym uh, tomorrow. I was like, all right. So I drive to Roslyn and I meet him. And as I'm driving through... Uh, uh, DC, there's the statue of Iwo Jima and there's the condos behind it. And I remember, I always remember looking at those condos, like, wow, like what would it be like to live there? Yeah. Well, after going to this gym and talking to Eric, he's like, Hey, let's go to my, let's go to my place. He lived in those buildings. Wow. And he, I w he started sharing his life story with me, which was very similar to mine. Mm. And I started to see in him what I could be. And I was just a troubled kid with very little options, but I was into sports and into lifting. And come to find out, he had corporate, uh, he had memberships or uh, exclusivity contracts at all the Gold's gyms owned by uh, John and Kirk Galliani, who owned corporate licensing for Gold's at that time. So I locked into him and was like, man, this is what I'm going to do. And uh, he really took me under his wing. He put me in a position um, of authority by eventually making me the uh, director of nutritional services, which really just meant I ran the software and I managed other people doing it by driving to all the locations. Right. And uh, that was kind of my first entrance into coaching. He helped me get my first PT cert uh, and all of those things. And then there was a series of events that happened in my life. Um, you know, I had some friends that went to prison. I had some friends that, you know, were killed. And, um, I remember telling my daughter's mother at that time, you know, like I said, I had my first kid at 16. It's like, hey, we got to get out of here. And my parents had already moved to Alabama. I just knew that if I stayed in the Washington, D.C. area, I'm going to prison or I'm I'm going to get killed. Well, yeah. You know, the way I was living, that's the two outcomes. Yeah. And uh, so we moved to Alabama and I had a fresh start. And um, I, in my mind, I was going to come here and start a, a training program just like Eric. But I got here and I kind of chickened out. I got a third shift job. <laughs> yeah. well, the, the misery of that uh, third shift job drove some wisdom into me. And I realized I did not want to work a job like this. Yeah. So I went down to the old Gold's Gym. I handed them my personal training certification and um, they let me in the door. And a couple months later, after realizing they were only charging trainers $200 a month and the chance uh, opportunity of me hiring a really or a, a really powerful lawyer hiring me to train him, we kind of talked through the idea of like, what would it take for me to do what Eric did? So I've told this story recently to uh, somebody that I was interviewing, but he said, man, what you should do is put it in like uh, PowerPoint. Yeah. And I, I was like, oh, okay, okay. And uh, I remember calling the girl that I was dating at the time. I was like, hey, what's PowerPoint? <laughs> and she was like, I didn't know what it was. And right. uh, he's like, oh, it's like slides. And you, I was like, oh, okay, okay. So that night, uh, you know, I went to my office, which back then was Books A Million, and uh, <laughs> I basically got a book on business plans and some other things. I was like, all right, I'm going to figure this out. I went to the, the restaurant that was across, sat down at the bar, got a drink, and asked the lady for the bar napkins. And I laid the napkins out kind of like a slide deck. A storyboard, just, dude. Yeah, I storyboarded it, right? Yeah. I just kind of wrote through it and how I was going to persuade this guy to let me take over the gym. Well, long story short, that worked out really well. Um, mm -hmm. I went to him and I said, hey, you're not making any money in here. All the trainers in here are doing different things. Your membership base is confused. There's no, no unified training system. 
let me, uh, let me take a shot at it and I'll make you more money. So we entered into a revenue uh, sharing deal and this was probably around 2000. And about a year later, I did the same thing at two other gyms in this town. They were Riviera Fitnesses. And then around 2004, I realized that I was chasing money and I was completely miserable. There was no purpose behind what I was doing. Sure. And I started to meet, I started training a couple of athletes like around 2002, 2003. Um, and it was funny how that happened because I'd really just started studying that stuff. I was on the old West Side board, the old mm. Charlie Francis board, the old yeah. Elite FTS board. Yeah. And that was where I was getting a lot of stuff. You know, I'm printing out stuff and putting it into binders yeah. to study and read. And, um, you know, long, long story short, um, I felt that my life story and what I had been through afforded me a good opportunity. I could mentor young kids who were in a really difficult stage of life and help them not get involved in a lot of the things that I got involved in. Sure. And that became the purpose and the mission. And, and at that point, you know, I'm, I'm learning about Charlie Francis. I'm learning about all these brilliant people. And I realized like, man, I don't even have a degree. I could, <laughs> you know, I could barely name a couple muscles, you know? Yeah. So I got very serious about my education. I had such a respect for the people in it um, and the industry as a whole. I was like, if I'm going to be good at this, you know, I've got to, I got to really know what the hell I'm doing. Yeah. And uh, I invested a lot in my education and started traveling to events and seminars and, you know, buying all the Russian training manuals, which was kind of a waste of time, but yeah. you know, we've all been down that road. Yeah. And I do think it, it had some value for me, if nonetheless, just improved my certainty that uh, I was educating myself. But around 2004, I met a coach and he invited me to basically run some speed camps at that school that. I ran the first speed camps in this entire area. Nobody had ever done it. And yeah. um, after that, I negotiated a deal to be their strength coach and to train private market clients out of that school. I also then became a strength coach at another high school so I, and multiple teams. So I was working with you know two schools, a wide range of teams, and a bunch of youth athletes. So my whole life from morning to night was actually coaching. Yeah. And I continued to do that for... 10 years. I was able to run an overhead free business. Um, and then I guess in 2013, you know, we'd won a state championship. The coach that I was with on the football side, I was a good mentor to me. And he was like, look, you, you have said you're planning to do this. He was like, within the next year or two, I'm going to leave. And he was like, that might be the time. And yeah. I kind of looked at that. I was like, all right, it's the time. And uh, so I guess it was 2012, I think maybe 2011. Yeah, I think I think it's about then when I opened this place here, and uh, we've been here ever since. Um, and there's a whole lot more to that. I mean, I, I could I'll circle back real quick. You know, in that time, my daughter, you know, she turned 13, and uh, from 10 to 13, she was dealing with some struggles and uh, wanted to live with me. So I ended up getting full custody of her uh, after two court battles, almost going broke twice. Still had to go to work and hold my head up and do what was required. But when I got custody of her, it really smacked me in the face because I realized this idea of me building a business, all I had done is create a job that I owned. <laughs> I could decide when I went to work, and but I didn't own a business, man, because I couldn't spend any time with her because I was yeah. taking care of other people's kids. And um, that was the big thing that made me go, man, all right, I got to really learn how to run a business. Otherwise, you know, I'm looking at my future. My kid's not going to know me. Yeah. And uh, that's what I did, you know, for the next 10 years, really from now. And I guess it's been 13 years because she's 26, almost 27. You know, I, I still study training on a regular basis, but a lot of my interests went into studying and learning business, hiring coaches, hiring mentors, joining masterminds, developing, you know, friends that I could communicate with, like you, Luca, a lot of other guys, just to help really sure up my knowledge and help filling gaps. Yep. that I had in my education because I didn't have a, a very linear path the way a lot of people did. I didn't go to college, get the degree, get the master's degree, do the internship. Right. You know, I really kind of had to learn a lot of this on my own um, through trial and error. So, I mean, that, that's, you know, 23 years and, well, 44 years really almost in a very short period. <laughs> I don't want to bore the audience too much, but there, there's a lot in there. No. First off, I don't, I don't think I ever heard the first part of that story. About really? You going and meeting with the guy and going into the, that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, you talk about like 
manifest destiny or yeah. something. You know what I mean? Like that's super cool. And I don't know, man, I just, I really feel like I'm a believer that everything happens for a reason, yep. you know, good and bad. Right. You know, sometimes the bad stuff, you learn even more from that, but man, that's really cool. I'd never heard that. Also for some reason, man, I guess I thought you started about the same time we did. Cause we started in 2008. We're always trying to catch up to Cressy. We never will. Cause they were Oh seven. You know, yeah. but I guess I didn't realize because I, I knew you for a coach for so long. I didn't realize you didn't open BCI until 12 or 13. Yeah. Well, I mean, BCI was open. It was called okay. Body Creations Incorporated. Yeah. So at first I just wanted to create this personal training company. And the goal yeah. was really to uh, like franchise them all over. Uh, a cha- Do you remember what year it was when Elite FTS had that seminar in Syracuse? Do you remember? Oh, my gosh. So Dude, well, I, I don't. Thinking, it was a very long time ago. A lot of people yeah. remember that. But um, I had a I had been trying to figure out what I was going to do with that business for like a couple of years. Like, how am I going to grow this? What am I going to do? Right. And I had a chance meeting with Dave Tate, and he talked about the Emith Mastery Program. Mm. So as soon as I got back, I enrolled in the Emith Mastery Program, and I built out this franchise prototype of how I was going to go into these gyms, like Eric had done, and get exclusivity contracts. And like almost as soon as I was done building it, the whole industry changed. They really yeah. quit letting in a lot of outside contractors. There was a period of time. I know it's come back around now. Yeah. There was a period of time where a lot of these gyms were like, we're, no, we do everything in-house. Absolutely. And things switched. And I was like, well, here we are. Yeah. And uh, I kind of, again, looked at that as a sign like your mission is in sport performance. It's not in building a franchise training company. I mean, I didn't even know why I wanted to do that other than I didn't want to be broke. And right. uh, I wanted to make money. You know, that was it. Yeah. So talk to me. You've mentioned a couple of times here, whether we're talking about coaching, whether we're talking about business, this idea of like really diving into continuing education. So what made you get started there? Was it just that like kind of little voice in the back of your head? Like, oh, I don't have the degrees or whatever that this person has. Like, what made you get into that? Because I know that's something ever since I've known you, you've been so like really militant about educating yourself. It's something I deeply respect about you, but like what made you get started on that path? I mean, if I'm honest, like in, I've kind of figured it out now. Yeah. Uh, it, it was really insecurity, man. Yeah. And, and fear it was, wow, all these people are really smart mm-hmm. and they're going to know that I'm a phony if I don't get smart too. <laughs> and <laughs> Now, I hadn't read a book probably since third grade, you know, when I really got yeah. into this stuff. <laughs> but, uh, I did grow up with two parents who were, you know, big readers. Um, my, my dad's side of the family, you know, a lot of them are really smart. You know, my grandmother had a Ph.D. My dad's brothers had Ph.D.s. Um, but I didn't get a lot of influence from them. I didn't spend a lot of time. My mom's family was kind of the opposite. Yeah. So I never really latched on to school. You know, I, I found a way to get through school. Um, using more of my ability to communicate, connect, persuade, which mm-hmm. I think just kind of got ingrained into me because of the, the, the environment I grew up in. But what I, when I first started reading about training, I did feel like, oh, wait a minute, for some reason this makes sense to me. And I think the fact that I knew I needed to do it to yeah. be respected and the fact that my first couple attempts at reading and understanding stuff went well, it hammered home to me like, oh, wait a minute, I can do this. Yeah. And I need, anytime I started to feel doubt, I would grab a book or a DVD or yeah. something because that was, uh, that was the way that I like worked myself out of that self doubt. It was, so I just kept leaning on education. Now I think at some point it took a weird turn and it became a significance game. It was like, mm-hmm. oh, I read that too. Oh, I read that too. Oh, yeah. I read that too. <laughs> I, and I recognize that about myself and that some of these things I read weren't really applicable to the private market environment. And this is why I was happy that I didn't have a lot of traditional training initially mm-hmm. because I would have felt obligated to bring that into the private market. Yeah. Where I started to recognize like, there's no way I can really build a perfect program in this world. Yeah. Um, all these kids have different coaches and you, you know, the variables Absolutely. And, and so do your listeners. Um, but that, that was helpful for me. And if, if I, I always say the, the thing that keeps a lot of really good strength coaches 
from building a really good business is that they're really good strength coaches. They mm. can't see <laughs> through their traditional training yeah. to modify variables that might not be perfect in the eyes of the literature, but still get results. And I mean, I, anecdotally, I've got a 23 year study here um, where I can tell you that doing things not perfect can create some very high outcomes with even some of the most elite athletes in, in the world. Yeah, no, I love it. Man, two things that you said. Number one, I think when you talked about when you were reading some of these books and it just naturally you were like, no, I, I get that. I think part of that is the fact that you didn't have the traditional background. You had like this really entrenched practical knowledge, right? You learned on yep. the fly. So from when you were 18 to now 44, like it wasn't, oh, this is what this textbook says. And Tudor Bampa says I should. No, it's like, hey, I tried this with this person. It worked. I'm going to keep doing it. Or this person didn't work. This didn't work with this person. I'm going to stop doing that. So yeah. I think that's that's huge, right? And like, look, I've got a girl right now I'm working with. I wrote this beautiful program for, her, right? But you know what? This week she can come in three days. You know what three days she can come in? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So I'm going to take her Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And I'm going to adapt the program because that's what's going to work for her yep. and her schedule. So there's that. But then you something else you said. I think this is, God, this is such a great point. Uh, you know who Craig Valentine is, right? Yeah. yeah so really. Craig always talks about action over anxiety. And I think, especially in this day and age, you hear the word anxiety so often. Man, anxiety is just like kind of just that that guilt in the back of your mind. You should be doing something. You should be doing something. You know what fixes that? Doing something. Doing something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like just, yep. just go do something, right? So like you, you start to feel insecure. You feel like you don't know something. Oh man, but if I read this book, now I'm leveling up. Now I don't feel that anxiety anymore. And I think that's, that's just such a great take home message. Yeah, man, that is probably, I would say like books, you know, saved my life in a lot of ways, man. They, um, they really, and I call it mining for gold and it kind of became my superpower. Mm -hmm. um, and even a lot of times now, if I make a comment on somebody's social media and I think it's really good, I'll just put the word gold. Mm -hmm. um, because what's really hard now is if you're a young coach, like if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably pretty well plugged in. Yeah, But, I mean, you oh, know how it is oh. for a lot of new people, right? Like, they come into this industry, and there's a lot of very persuasive characters that actually have no idea really what they're doing. They don't have the pedigree, and you can kind of fall down that trap. I mean, what what's helped me a lot is figuring out who I needed to know, who were, like, the best in the world at these things, spending money, going to their facilities, taking their certifications, um, investing in those people you know, seeing if there's a way I could help them or share in some way. Yeah. And uh, I, that all started from reading those. Like, okay, I found the right books through the right people. And it's like, okay, well, how can I keep that going? Well, instead of just buying the books or like, I remember I used to di dissect all your articles on uh, T Nation, uh, Eric Cressy's. I mean, I used to dive into that stuff. Again, print them out. Joe DeFranco, he was another one. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, James Smith, you know, all these guys, I would really just dissect their stuff but it was like okay well how do i take that next level and this was i don't even know the year but it's when more continuing at seminars became a thing and i would search out these kind of obscure seminars um, <laughs> until it became a bigger thing and uh, then i was like this is deepening my knowledge because now i can go meet with other people studying the same things over beers and food we could talk about those things and then i selfishly i think in my mind was like comparing myself, although I would say this is a very unhealthy thing. Yeah. But I needed it for me to be like, I belong here. Like, I'm smart enough. I belong here. Because if you looked at like who I was training and the type of athletes I was training, I hope this doesn't sound arrogant, but there there wasn't many people training the amount no. and quality of athletes I was training. No. You have some absolute and, um, studs. Yeah, that we, have come through had, your like, space. We've had like 13 kids that grew up in my program that have gone to the NFL. We've yeah. had multiple kids that have grew up in our program that have gone to Major League Baseball, the NBA. Um, we, we stopped counting a couple of years ago, like 270-some Division One scholarships of kids that have trained wow. here. that's amazing. And uh, there's not a lot of places that can do that, but I still had this, this inferiority complex because a lot of that, quite frankly, has to do with geography. You know, I moved to a really – good place with a lot of great athletes um, and ironically a place that had a lot of expendable income too, which I didn't, didn't realize. So 
the good athletes could afford my services. Um, yeah. And the ones that didn't, I had a special place for them in my heart and I'd scholarship them and, you know, take care of them. Yeah. I love it, man. Okay. So something else I'm curious about who influenced you early on as a coach, right? Like who are the people you were looking up to and then how did you take the stuff that you were learning and infuse it into what you were doing on the gym floor? So early, early on, like I got into Gary Gray's stuff. Uh huh. And because it was, it just was so opposite to powerlifting and bodybuilding. Yeah. yeah. But that didn't last real long. It just didn't speak to me the way a lot of other stuff did. Um, but I would say Westside, mm-hmm. Joe Ken, and Mike Boyle. Yeah. Those were kind of the big ones early on that I latched onto. And Coach Ken. That's specific, pretty good. Pretty good crew right there. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty sure. solid, right? But, you know, I remember I would. I would call Elite FTS and talk to Jim Windler. I mean, Jim was <laughs> this is back yeah. when like Jim would answer the phone yeah. uh, at Elite FTS pre five three one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After five three one. <laughs> what he for, but like, and I would beat Jim's ears up, man. And uh, he was always very kind to me. So I, I mean, Jim's got to go in there. Yeah. Again, Dave Tate was influential, but the two people that I say have kind of like been my mentors. Uh, or Joe Ken and Mike Boyle, even though I did a mentorship of Boyle in like 04. Yep. But uh, Coach Ken as a whole, man, has just been really solid for me. I, I talked about that, you know, insecurity and overcoming that. And one of the ways I did overcome that is I had a kid who he'll tell you, I, I raised up in the weight room. This kid played four years of college football and never touched the weight. He would just kind of, he worked for, a, or he played at an HBCU and, uh, they didn't have a real organized program. And he kind of just got out of it. Yeah. Well, he was a very draftable kid, though. And uh, I raised him up in the weight room. He got drafted. Uh, after he's with the Dolphins for a while, he ended up going to the Panthers. And that's when Coach Ken was there. And, you know, me educating myself helped a lot with that. But there was one day where he, you know, told me, he was like, man, you've done a great job with this kid. Like, you handed him off. You know, he's a very good lifter. Um, you know, he's competent. You handed him off to me, not injured. Yeah. And, you know, he gave me some really good advice there. He said, that's your number one goal, you know, when working with professional athletes, just get them to me healthy. Yeah. Like so many people mess them up, you know, and that was, that was big for me. So there's, there's a lot of other people, man, that were instrumental. I mean, I, you and Eric were big influences because one, I could, I could probably write at a third grade level at that point, but, um, I just really, really loved T nation and you guys were becoming big names there. And, so there's a lot of people, but if you made me name two, it would be Coach Ken and, and Boyle. Well, look, one thing that I always appreciated too, like being on being on stage with with Joe was always entertaining, right? You know, we did those three Eid seminars yep. over the years, and I know you attended most, if not all, of those. I was so I one. always <laughs> I, exactly. So I always loved the banter between you guys, but you can always tell who Joe really respects. And the way he talks to people and I could just tell like, no, he respects Andy and the work that you've done. So that was very cool to see that side of it. And I mean, look, like you said, okay, if we're taking kind of the bird's eye view of the early 2000s, if you got West Side slash Elite, right, you got all your powerlifting foundational strength there. Joe's one of the first people that's actually talking about you developing all these different physical qualities with tier system. And then Mike Boyle fills in all the gaps you know, when he's talking about split stance and single leg and man, that's a really fe- like really strong crew to, to learn from early on in your career. Yeah. And then even if you kind of go back to Gary Gray, kind of the multi planer stuff, like I yeah. still, I kept a lot of that in, you know, what, what I did with people. And, um, yeah, yeah. Ironically, just kind of falling into those places really helped round out my education in a lot of ways. I think we're always looking for blind spots, right? Or good people that aspire to be good coaches, program designers are always looking for blind spots. And you take those three, you infuse it the right way. There's not a lot of blind spots in your program. If you look further into like who are their mentors, who did they learn from? Now you really, which again, some coach can hammer home. It's like, you got to know your history in this industry. Like it's amazing to me that there's strength coaches that don't know who Johnny Parker is or Boyd Upley or, you know, people like that. I felt obligated to go back and learn that history, like, like yeah. U S history, you know, it's like, I need yeah, to it know is. this industry. 
Yeah, I love it. Okay, so we talked about this pre-show, and I really want to hear your your thoughts here because yep. I feel like personally, most, maybe not all, but most coaches at some point doubt themselves, right? I think it's logical because there's this perception that, hey, it doesn't matter how good you are, the quality of the work, that everybody out there is doing better work, right? And it's even... I think it's even harder now because of social media and all that. Everybody's flashing their highlight reel, who they're working with, the success they're having, all that. So I think it's natural, right? But I'd love to hear, did you ever go through a time where you really doubted yourself as a coach? And if so, how did you get through it? I mean, I think that was probably the thing pushing me along all the time. You know, it's probably always playing in the background of my head. It was a constant... You know, you have to know so much about this stuff and be so good at coaching that nobody goes, hey, what school did you go to? Because I never wanted to answer the question of, oh, I didn't I didn't go to college. Right. So really smart guy that most people know about now is that uh, Alex Hormozzi guy. Oh, yeah. And, and, and he's got a quote where he says, outwork your self-doubt. And mm. uh, that resonated with me so much. It was on this whiteboard. I wrote it really big for and literally I did it like last year. I wrote out work your self doubt um, because it's still a constant in my life, man. Um, I don't have a lot of the measurables like the degrees. And I mean, I, shoot, NSCA wouldn't even let me sit for a CSCS. And I, and I would, I would smoke that test on a, on a bad day. <laughs> and, uh, right. So I always, I always had that, but for me it was like, okay, what are the people that I respect reading? What are they doing? Who are they learning from? Where are they going? And I just leaned into that. It's like, if I didn't trust myself, it was like, okay, well, I trust them. And yeah. I'm just going to follow what they do. Yep. And then, you know, I really I hadn't been around a lot of strength coaches, you know? Like, I was kind of in my own bubble. So, I mean, I think I went to go visit Joe DeFranco in, like, 2002 or something. Um, I went to Jersey. I, like I said, I went to Boyles in 2004. Yeah. Um, I joined a, a mastermind kind of early on. And I started getting around other coaches, even coaches I respected and going like, oh, wait, I, I do have a handle on this. Like, I do understand it. And then I had a body of work that it was, it was pretty daggone good, man. Like the, the amount of kids and the quality of athletes I was training across multiple levels started to close that gap for me. It's like, surely I don't have all these people fooled. Like I might be kind of good at this. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Dude, I so I was about to jot this down, but I'll just say it. I really feel like if we're being totally honest and transparent, eighty percent of training and coaching is common sense. <laughs> yeah. Like like eighty percent of it. Now, the next twenty percent you're gonna have to work for, right? Because yeah. that's the details and the nuance. And now it's so much easier, right? So think about think about back in the day. Okay, yeah, we had the major resources. You had West Side, you had Elite, T Nation, Mike Boyle, but a lot of the 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 nitty gritty stuff, maybe you didn't have the same access to, right? But yep. now it's like, what do you want to learn about? Linear speed? Perfect. There's people for that. You want to learn about multi-directional speed? Got that. Conditioning, force plates, braking. You know, it's just so much easier now because there's all the realms and then all like the little segments of it versus back in the day, you had to really like apply yourself. And yeah. there was just more process to it. Like, okay, who are these people? Who have they trained? Do they actually know what they're talking about? Do they fit into like my philosophy and my filter? So I don't know. It's a lot. It's in some ways it's easier now because there's so many more people to learn from. But I feel like in some ways you also have to filter that much harder now because it's so easy to look good on the internet. So that's actually a part of my strategy to educate our coaches. I I realize that it's harder than ever to find the good. Because there's so many, right? Mm -hmm. And somebody who really doesn't know what they're doing could be just using some exercises they found and they're persuasive. And you might actually believe them and fall down the wrong trap. So knowing that people are learning through these like little Instagram sound bites and videos, when we onboard a new coach, I start sending them your content, Altus's content, like whatever Mm, I trust and, and value, I send that to them to give them that filter early on. And I I literally tell them, stop following accounts other than the ones I send you or the <laughs> ones that you really dig, like run it by me. And I will yeah. tell you 
all I got to do 90% of the time is go check who they follow. Oh, and yeah. I can tell you whether or not they're kind of in the know or they at least align with the philosophy that we believe in in here. So yeah. I do think you need a filter more than ever yes. because everything is coming at you at one time. Whereas for me, it was like understand strength and power first. Yeah. Then it was understand speed. And then really, I kind of came to movement after that. Right. You know, and then right. shit, I'm still learning about, you know, a lot of stuff, man. I have different <laughs> perspectives on conditioning and movement than, you know, than I ever have. So, yeah. Well, part of that is the aging process, right? <laughs> and You're constantly reminded you can't just bang heavy weights all day, every day anymore. As much as it, it would be fun. You know, especially in my world, you know, I got oh. two titanium hips to show for it. So. <laughs> Well, so it's funny you say that because that's something that we're trying to do too. As you know, we're moving to more of like an independent contracting model out of our gym, but they're still reflective of iFast, right? Yep. Even though they're not repping iFast, like by law, they can't wear iFast stuff while they're on the floor because yep. then they could be considered employees. But that doesn't mean I'm not trying to educate them, right? right. Like we got a new kid starting. Hey, I'm going to get him in my cert. I'm going to get him part of iFast U. Hey, what are you into? Speed? Perfect. Here's five people. You need to be learning from like trying yep. to just guide and shape that next generation, which actually takes me like directly into my next question. Because one thing I've always respected about you is I feel like, yeah, you're Andy McCloy and you're the owner of BCI. But at the same time, you've always done a really good job of grooming the guys and girls underneath you. Right. Like you yeah. always tried to pay that forward. And obviously part of that's business oriented. Right. Yep. <laughs> you want your coaches to be good because it's good for you. But is there a bigger picture or meaning behind that for you? Because it feels like there is. Yeah, it's um, it's trying to give people what I needed, like what I had to mm. go search out for. Yeah, like I can now provide that for you. And um, yeah. I tell Coach Elk, like I can unfairly advance your education. Like if yes. you if you get plugged in here, you will know more in a shorter period of time than the vast majority of people. But I like this idea of like walking with people you know it, it might be a an authority issue right because i mean one thing we didn't really talk about is i've never really had i've had two other jobs in my life one is a trainer and then when i first moved to alabama i took a third shift job kind of like babysitting computers yeah. and then i just jumped out the window and said i'm starting a business so i <laughs> i've really kind of just worked for myself the vast majority of my life but i never wanted to be anybody's guru yeah even the coaches i mentor i'm like man i'm not your guru like that don't look to me you know, like that. Um, I want to walk with you on this path and I'll help you make decisions at each turning point mm. that could possibly save you money, time and headaches. You know, so that that has been the overarching philosophy is it's it's always coaching. It's always mentorship. And the best way that I can do that is not sitting across from the table at you telling you things It's to sit beside you or walk beside you and help nurture you through that path. Mm. I like and that. And the average a lot. coach has worked here about six years. I mean, so we've got I was to gonna say, your staff. They stay and they stick. Yeah. Well, and I, I think that's a testament not only to you getting out of their way, right? Like yep. they don't feel like you're impeding their progress, but in fact, quite the contrary, you're helping them grow and get better. And it's a testament to you in the business, right? Because I think in some ways at IFAST, man, it was like, yeah, we were successful. We built great coaches, but then other people want great coaches, <laughs> Yeah, you know? So keep it's hard. hard to keep those people. So that it's a testament to you that you found a way to keep them with you as well and continue to give them opportunities to grow and evolve. That's really awesome. Yeah. I appreciate that. I mean, I think that did, that very much has to do with the realization that I had when I got custody of my daughter. It was like, this can't be about me. This, this, yeah. this can't be built around my name, my personality, my, you know, because for years, and our staff even talks about, like, when they first started, so you're talking about less than 10 years ago, the talk in this town is like, hey, are you going to Andy's today? Are you going to Andy's gym today? So even though BCI was a thing, it was still Andy's, Andy's gym. gym. Yeah. But now, I'll walk in this gym, and I'll meet somebody, and I'm like, hey, how you doing? And they'd be like, well, who are you? I'm like, oh, I'm Andy. I'm the guy that owns this place. You know, <laughs> so it's like, it's, it's weird yeah. now that I don't know the majority of people here, you know? Yeah. But again... Talk about building like a real sustainable business. It's not 100% person personality driven, right? Mm -hmm. Like your personality, like if you don't show up, business dries up, right? That's right. Now you go away. It's what Cosgrove used to always talk about, right? 
when he had cancer, yo, he can't be in the gym for like six, nine, 12 months. How did your gym operate when that happens? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, when he said that, it makes you think. It does. It does. Um, That E-Myth program was really helpful for me to make me aware of that. You know, we have the laborer, the manager, and the entrepreneur, and you can't wear all the hats and really build a business. Yeah. And I knew that I needed to ascend to a level where I didn't have to do the day-to-day operations. And I think there are less people now than ever who are looking at building a training business through that lens. It seems to be now very content-driven, very personal brand-driven, which I don't think is wrong. And I fully accept, I mean, Kanye is selling $19 million worth of Yeezys on the Super Bowl commercial that he shot on his cell phone shows That's you the wild. power of brand over marketing, right? Yeah. But if your personal brand is your business, you are attached to that for forever. Yeah. And quite frankly, I didn't know if that's what I wanted to do. I've got a lot of interests and um, as ate up as I am with this stuff, I didn't want to put my name on the door. I didn't want it to be about me because I recognized that that would be a lot harder to walk away from. Yeah. Well, I know that's something Eric's talked about in the past. I bet. Pretty sure somebody tried to talk him out of that. And he's like, no, it'll be all right. And now he's yeah. like, damn. Why did I put my name on the business? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's you forever at that point. Yeah. So you kind of alluded to this, but I think that everyone in our shoes who has done the dual thing, right? Like you're the coach, like the coach, at least for a certain period of time, and the owner of the business. At some point, you realize that if you want to take these things to a really high level, you can't do both at the highest levels, right? Because As you ascend, you get around really good coaches and you're like, wow, I want to be like them. And then you get around really good business owners and you're like, well, I want to be like them. You know, so it's almost impossible to do both at a high level. So I'd love to hear your thoughts here. Number one, do you agree? And if so, which way do you find yourself leaning more these days? Um, I totally agree. Totally agree. I think in order to run a really good business that lasts, you have to start with your coaching pedigree. Mm -hmm. I do think at some point in time, you have to switch and put the same level of effort that was put into your coaching pedigree into understanding how to run a business. And again, I'm probably biased to that because that was my my path and my journey. But I I do talk to a lot of sport performance and fitness business owners. And a lot of times, the solutions that I provide or input I provide come from my understanding of strength and conditioning not Mm. so much my understanding of business. Um, There's specific things with how people run programs. I'll give you an example. Yeah. Somebody says, I, you know, I just, I can't get enough leads and uh, our attrition is too high. Okay. Somebody's going to tell you direct response, you know, uh, maybe, you know, do some internal stuff to form bonding capital. But I always start going, does the product suck? (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Are you struggling to get clients because your reputation is not that you're an expert in your community? Mm. And if you took more time to become an expert in your community, would you get more leads? And I and would you keep more clients? I mean, we've had kids that started in our program at eight years old. They didn't leave till they were 18. Yeah. Like so Jaden Hill plays for played for University of Florida, but he with Texas A&M now, I mean, he started at eight years old. Uh, Jamil Muhammad that plays for USC. He started with us like 10 years old. Wow. You know, and it's, they knew where to go, right? Because they wanted to, they knew that my spot was the spot. And then because it was good, they stayed. Yeah. I had a kid that just left the Titans. He's now with the uh, Saints. He sent me a message the other day. He said, the best strength and conditioning I've ever had in my life. He also played at a big time SEC school that I'll leave nameless. Said that hands down the strength and conditioning he got here was better than anywhere else he's ever been. And uh, I hope that doesn't sound arrogant. It's just I'm just telling you the truth about what this kid has said. And I think the biggest mistake that a lot of sport performance and fitness business owners make is thinking that all the business solutions have to do with the mechanics of business operations um, and sales and marketing. If you aren't that good at the job, that's always going to affect your ability to build a business. And you've been in a bunch of masterminds too, right? When, oh, yeah. When you enter into a mastermind, nobody goes, are you any good as a trainer? They just <laughs> automatically start teaching you 
the marketing and the sales, and they, they kind of have to assume that you are good, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I think that creates this misalignment of expectations and an understanding of really what's required to build a good training business. Um, one of the things we've talked about now is we bring in coaches and nobody knows how to coach anymore. Like yeah. we, me and you probably start, I started one-on-one. Absolutely. Yeah. One-on-one. So then if you can do one-on-one, you can do one to a few, then you can do one to many. But we got a lot of people coming into this industry and their first entrance was something like, say, CrossFit or Orange Theory, which, yeah. listen, I, I think they all have their place. I'm not, sure. I'm not trying to, you know, shit on those brands. Yeah. But I've literally turned it CrossFit coaching where you kind of stand in the middle of the room and you watch people in a very authoritative position, you know, hands on <laughs> hips, maybe yeah. throw a couple claps in and let's go. <clears throat> and the timer and the work out of the day kind of dictates everything in these random uh, ways that they regress and progress. I, I think that's setting people up for failure, man. They yeah. don't really know how to coach a person. They know how to manage a room. Yeah. You know, Dude, that's something that, we're working on here. We, we are, co- we're actively working now to continue to tighten up our coaching product. And because that is, that's what we hang our hat on. And it, it has to be constantly, you know, changed and iterated to stay at standard. Well, look, here's, here's the best point that you made is, what most of us don't understand, or maybe you do now, if you've been in this game for a little while, this game has changed a lot in yeah. 10 years. Think think about the just the absolute like earth shattering numbers that CrossFit was doing 10 years ago, right? Where is CrossFit now, right? Like as a brand. So imagine <laughs> that. But now when you and I opened, and I'm just going to lump that into the last like 10, 15 years, hey man, everybody was trying to do small underground warehouse style gym, semi-private, like that was the model. But, oh man, what's going on now? All these fitness franchises, right? And hey man, you don't need a skilled coach to run an Orange Theory class. And again, I'm not, I'm not, that's not a down thing. Like, hey, if that's what you want as a fitness consumer, by all means, go do it. But guys like you and I, we hang our hats on running a coaching based model. And so if you're going to run that, better make sure you got damn good coaches running that model. Absolutely. Because the guy that just stands in the middle or the girl that just stands in the middle and claps a couple times and barks orders, they're not going to cut it in our gyms. Not at all. And I think it's a very, very important thing for coaches to understand for a really important reason. Like I remember when CrossFit hit. Actually, I had heard about CrossFit in like 04, 03, yeah. sitting in a USAW Olympic weightlifting certification in Columbus, Ohio. Okay. That guy next to me started talking about it. He worked for like the Scottsdale um, Fire Department, and they were okay. doing it. He sent me the journals, and I started reading it. I was like, well, this is not true. What are they talking <laughs> about? This is, this is not what I have been reading about for the past right. however long. Right. And so I did not jump on that bandwagon the way a yeah. lot of people did. But what helped me and in, in kind of where I'm going with that is – my understanding of training and coaching gave me the certainty that I did not have to join that club to be successful. <laughs> right. And it also gave me ammunition to fight back against them if we were fighting for clients. Yeah. Um, you know, show me any research that, you know, high rep cleans done in a fatigued state is going to develop the same outcomes that we can create doing it the way that Olympic lifting is traditionally programmed. Yeah. Doesn't exist. You know, well, maybe some CrossFitter exploited some research by now, but yeah. Um, And again, this is not to pick on CrossFit. I think they've done a lot of good stuff. It's just that my certainty, and maybe it was a little arrogant, but my certainty that I know more than these people, it kept me going. It it, it was like, I will fight. What I won't do is quit. Like, I'm not an engineer that started a CrossFit box as a second stream of income. Right. This is what I do. And um, yeah, that's worked out pretty good. I love it. Okay. One more kind of big-ish question, and then we'll we'll jump into our lightning round. So this is kind of like the evolution of Andy McCloy, right? Because obviously you've done the coaching thing. Now you're evolving. You're into the business side of this. And a lot of people, I think, go through this, right? People that have been in our shoes. Like I very clearly remember there was a point in my life where I was like, I don't want to manage like 10 people. I don't want to franchise a gym. Like I enjoy the coaching side of it. No, nothing about this business pulls me so hard in that direction that that's where I want to spend my time. So that's why, okay, we're going to shift our business model and I'm going to do what I do. 
was there a moment like that for you where you're just like constantly getting pulled in these two different directions and you're like, I can't do both at the level I want. I'm going to, I'm going to triple down on this. Yeah. And again, it was, it was probably when I got custody of my daughter, but there was also, a, I share with my coaches uh, the importance of being present in their role. And if you're coaching, you're coaching. Cause I, I remember being out on a football field and I was running some athletes and all I could think about was everything I needed to get done on the business side. Mm, yeah. And I remember thinking, you got to get off the floor because if you keep doing this, your business will go down because you're not the same coach. Yeah. I started to realize that my mind, and this is just like what's required, like paying the bills was more important than like assessing the joint angles of this kid's sprint. Right. Right. It, no matter how hard consciously I wanted to focus on that subconsciously my brain was over here and that made me go, man, you got to You got to get this right. And, um, that was scary because again, yeah. the only thing I knew was coaching and my identity was coaching. Well, the only thing I knew I was good at, you know, yeah. I, you know it's like, am I going to even be any good at like trying to run this business? Um, I knew I was pretty good at sales. Uh, in fact, I told somebody the other day, I think I've sold, probably more face-to-face -face sport performance contracts than anybody in our industry, just sheer time and, and volume. Yeah. But yeah. those were the two things I knew I was good at. I could sell my program and I could coach my program. Could I lead other people? No clue. Uh, right. Could I build a business that I understand, you know, some of the things I understand now in regards to financial management and uh, kind of the purpose now is like build one cash flowing asset and put it in another. I didn't yeah. understand that stuff. You know, I didn't know if I'd be any good at any of it. You know, I think there's a really important message here. And, you know, fear gets kind of a bad rap. We should all be fearful, right? It's baked into us as humans, right? If you see a bear or some wild animal when you're out hiking, you should be fearful. But I think there's the presence of fear and then something that you have always done, you know, along the way is you've stepped into your fear and you've stepped into your discomfort. You haven't let that ruin you. Yeah. And I think that's something that, every coach, every entrepreneur needs to understand is there's always moments of self-doubt. There's always moments where you're leveling up, right? Or trying to take that next step. It should be uncomfortable. Yes. And I think, you know, like the way they try and sell it on social media and the way people try and sell it now, they try and make it sound easy. It's not. It's, it's not. not. And it shouldn't be. It right. should be. Growth is never easy. It shouldn't be comfortable. I mean, like, it takes time and it takes effort. And if you're not uncomfortable, you're probably not getting better. Yeah. I mean, everybody thinks that they're going to walk into a gym and have their perfect job at the perfect pay, the <laughs> perfect hours they want to work. And there's absolutely no evidence that this will ever work in any industry. Yet it's become this dominant message. Um, and I think it's, it's kind of baked into society now. You know, people that would rather stay at home than go to work. And again, I'm yeah. not judging you. I'm just stating the facts. If any of you are sensitive listening to this, but <laughs> it's, um, it's, I had zero expectation that anybody was going to hand me anything. And I think that that mental positioning forced a level of commitment, almost a compulsive and obsessive nature that served me well. And th this Sunday, this past Sunday, I did like a two hour in staff with our team and some of the new coaches were onboarding really just kind of a reality check of what coaching is and what it isn't yeah, and uh, what it takes to be good. And I told everyone, I was like, listen, guys, I want you to spend time with your family. I want you to enjoy watching football games. Um, but I want you to know something. When I was coming up, I looked at people like that as food. Yeah. Because while you're watching football, I'm reading, studying, and coaching. While you're doing all the things with your family, like I didn't go on a vacation for over a decade. Yeah, that's crazy. And I'm not saying don't do those things because, I mean, you know me, like my family's first, man. I put them yeah. first. I build my life around them. But there was a time in my life where it was required to put yeah. my, my job and my business first. And we're being sold that, like, you don't have to do that. So, yeah. Okay, well, if you just want to be like an average coach and work somewhere and hop around gym to gym, you may not have to do that. But if you really want to be good, if you want to be great, dare I say, like it's going to require an extra effort. You can't work like the other guy at the gym. Yeah. You have to work harder than him. Yeah. Dude, so Eric and I talked about this exact topic, and we talked about the willingness to sacrifice, 
right? Sacrifices must be made if you want to be good or dare you say great. Yeah. And, and I love training analogies, right? But if you want to be average at all things, go out and just do a little bit of everything, right? But if you want to be a great trainer and coach, at some point, you're going to have to push yourself, right? Now, it's not to say you do that at the detriment of everything else in your life, because, hey, you do it well enough and long enough at some point, now you can start to maintain those other physical qualities, right? Hey, I move pretty well. Now I'm going to layer on some strength. Okay, now I'm going to maintain these two. Now I'm going to add in conditioning. It's just like training. It's a little bit callous way to look at, you know, your personal life. But that's how you you're objective about it, right? Because if you think just magically, you're going to do the same thing forever and like level up in any area of your life, you are sorely mistaken. I I totally agree. And like my kids, um, they know I love them. They know I care about them. And if I got to work on a Sunday to do a two hour in staff, uh, they're not going to forget that. Yeah. And if you so if you're doing your job when you are at home and you are present, you don't have to sacrifice the connection with your family just because you're working more. And I would argue that a lot of people in your family may not everybody will respect you even more because of it. And yes, like my kids know, man, like I'm not building this for me. Um, I mean, yeah, it's for me, but I got kids and grandkids. I got to be able to leave them something. Yeah. And I don't want them to think that you can do that, you know, sitting at home eight hours a day. Cause that's just not reality. <laughs> All right. And, uh, I, I want them to know that you got to work hard for things that matter to you. And, um, you know, Ed milet has got this great video where he's talking about being the one, you know, I'm the one in my family. I'm the one. And that really, like I, that really resonated with me. It's like, no, 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 yeah. I'm going to be the one, like, I'm going to be the one I'm going to yeah. make sure that, you know, I leave something for my kids and, I have ideas of what I want that to be, but it's, it's more important that I hold myself accountable to the process required to get there. Yeah. And that, and that might mean, you know, traveling to go to some masterminds or meetings or seminars or in staffs on Sundays. The one thing I won't ever ask anybody on my team to do is something I haven't done. Yeah. And, uh, I mean that. Yeah. I love that. Well, and I just always think about when it comes, but comes down to it, like you said, sacrifices have to be made, right? But like you, my kids know if I've got to do something on a Saturday, it's there's no other day to do it. That's when it's got to be done. And think about like the messaging in that, right? It's I'm not sacrificing you. It's this is important, right? This is what hard work looks like. Sometimes we have to make sacrifices, but on the back end, you also know I'm going to find a way to make it up to you, right? Perfect. We're going to go do something special. We're going to go find something else to do. It's never a no, I'm always putting my work above you. It's like, hey, if this has to get done. It has to get done. It's part of my job. Yeah, it's an opportunity right? to coach your kids. Like my, Absolutely. Uh, it was a couple of weeks ago, my daughter said, I said, babe, I got to go to the gym. And I got to work on something. It's really important. And my daughter, as clever as she is, she looks at <laughs> gives me the pouty face and goes, more important than me. <laughs> and, she, and she was kind of joking, like I could tell, like yep. giving me crap. And I said, let me, let me tell you something. There is nothing more important than you to me, but. When it comes to comparing going to the gym to work on this versus us sitting home and just kind of hanging out, right now that is more important. Yeah. But don't you ever equate that to your worth and value in my life. Yes. Right? So there's an opportunity to, to coach and connect even when you have yes. to make sacrifices. You yes. know? But yes. people, they just see the sacrifice. They don't, you know, they don't understand that there's actually some real value in showing your kids and your family that too. Yeah, well... The thing I always come back to is I hope I'm showing my children that you don't have to go to work every day and be miserable. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah. like I, I'm just being totally honest. Like I love my job, dude. Yeah. I love what I get to do. I'm passionate about it. I'm there's never, maybe not never very, yeah. very rarely. <laughs> is there a yeah. day that I don't want to go to work? Right. And I hope they understand that, that, Hey man, yeah. you don't have to be miserable. Like so many people out here, you can wake up every day, Love your job. Be excited about it and want to grow and get better. So That's right, man. That's all right. right. Lightning round, dude. Four all questions. Right. Your answer can be as long or short as you like. All right. Okay. So I'm a little slow on the uptake here. The shoe game, man. Uh, I don't think I'll ever achieve your level of wisdom. But, man, we're starting to get into it around here. You know, I got yeah, some yeah. decent shoes. My daughter, definitely. She loves the oh, shoe game. Yeah. So you got to pick one pair to rock. And I know this is probably an impossible question for you. One pair to rock the rest of your days. What are you going with? Um, I'm going to give you two, but I'm going to answer it differently. 
Okay. Because I, cause I couldn't wear the one every day because it would jack my, you know, knees and hips up. I, okay. I figured that out. But from a everyday shoe I could wear forever is like any type of Dunk or Jordan 1 Low. Like okay. it, any of those. Okay. But if you really know shoe culture and shoe history, this is this might be interesting for some yeah. of your learners or your listeners. If you grew up in D.C., Baltimore, Philly, New Balance was cool in the 90s the way it is now. Really? But it's one of the only places. I was blown away when I moved to Alabama. Everybody looked at New Balance as just like a bad shoe, right. like a dad shoe. Yeah. What would be inter- like if you if you literally Google New Balance, Washington, D.C., culture, I bet you'll come up on some articles that I've shared with people. Okay. New Balance was the first $200 tennis shoe. In my world, and it was the 990, to be clear. Yeah. In my world, Jordans were cool, but 990s were cooler. Because this is what really kind of like the the street hustlers, people that you knew they had money. They drove nice cars. They wore, they wore 990s because they were comfortable okay. enough to wear all day on the block and run if you needed to. <laughs> and, they, and they also were pretty fashion forward, but went with everything. They were gray and they were blue back then, or yeah. like a navy blue. So yeah. they matched everything. Okay. So the 990s, man, culturally have a lot of significance in my life. And it's been cool now that it's kind of making a resurgence. And I still think New Balance, like the 860s, the 990s, and there's a couple other silhouettes. They're just they're just world class, man. And yeah. uh, But I can't wear a shoe that has that much support these days without my knees and my back hurting. So huh. I, I rotate wild. them a good bit. Okay. Yeah. See, I kind of expected the dunks. Or like some yeah. Jordan ones, but yeah, yep. did not expect New Balance. Yeah, I, okay. thought, I figured I'd throw you a curveball there. So. That was definitely a curveball. Yep. Okay, number two. I feel like we've already touched on this a little bit, but just to summarize, how has being a dad impacted you? It's my whole identity. I mean, it's uh, it's it. Well, I shouldn't say it's my whole identity. It's it's a big part. It's a big part, and it's I've been a father more years of my life than not at forty four years old. It's like it's yeah. really all I know. Um, yeah. It's given purpose to my life. It's humbled me. It's helped me get my ego in check, made me realize what's really important in life. Um, it's helped me, you know, people, every, everybody's on a trauma journey these days, right? Like everybody's yeah. healing from trauma. Yeah. Well, being a parent is, it'll, it'll reflect back to you the areas of yourself that are unhealed or that you need to work on. Mm. And uh, I'm grateful for that. It showed me a lot of things about myself at times that I didn't really like uh, that I had to work on. And uh, that's been really valuable for me. Yeah, I like that. Okay, so you have owned BCI for 11, 12 years now, approximately? Well, yeah. It's been 23 years since I incorporated the company. Right. We've been in this building, I think, 12 or 13 years. Okay, that's where I'm going with this. Yeah. What's one or two of the biggest lessons you've learned running a business in a physical location? Um, that being a really good coach can overcome deficits in regards to marketing. Facts. And, and again, this is not the common talk now. Yeah. Because if you're a fitness person and you log on to the internet, all you're going to be bombarded with is better ways to market, which, yeah. which is not wrong. Okay. It's not wrong. You need to get good at marketing uh, for sure. And it is a master skill that everybody probably needs to lean into. But coaching can help you really overcome a lot of that. You do a lot, really good job with the people in front of you and you serve the people and then you ask them to bring people. You can go a pretty good business. Yeah. Um, I, I probably had 100 clients before I ever ran a Facebook ad. Yeah. And so I think that that's first. Um, the second thing is spend more time investing in your community than shooting content. And again, this is another message that a lot of people yes. um, may disagree with me about, but I'm, I'm going to make a strong case. You know, let's say you have 2,000 followers. You know, probably 40% of them are your high school friends, your parents, and people that will never buy from you ever. Yeah. If we further segment the algorithm, probably 10% of the people that will buy from you are seeing it. So you spend all this time creating good content and reels and all these things. If we add all that up, and this is a lot of the advice that I know people are getting in the market now is like three posts a day and this. And it's like, man. While you're doing that, I'm out meeting 10 business owners. I'm working a field day at an elementary school. You know, I'm going and shadowing strength coaches at another school that I want to build a relationship with. I'm making sure at my coffee shop, I'm building rapport with them. So if I want to do a pop-up and make offers, yep. 
So invest in your local community. And this is something that I talked about when you had me speak at Physical Prep. Yep. Was that my philosophy is become a local legend, right? Yes. Own, that. own the block, own the county. Quit worrying about how popular you are in other places because they don't pay your bills. <laughs> now, now, if you're online or you know, you're in the digital marketing space, totally different thing, right? Sure. But if we talk specific to brick and mortar, get out in your community, get out from behind your computer and go connect and talk to people. Nobody cares about your 15th video of how to do an RDL. They just don't <laughs> care. No. But if you go connect with them and you can reflect back that you can solve their problem, you got a pretty good shot at getting them as a client. Yeah. Dude, when, one of the only things, I'm not even going to say regret. I'm just going to be honest. Like One of the biggest things that we did not do well at IFAST was marketing, right? We just yeah. never did. Now, we were incredibly successful because we were really good coaches, yep. right? And not just Bill and I, like the entire tree, the entire staff was really good coaches. But yeah, I mean, we ran a really successful business and I'm not saying you should do it like that, yep, right? Yep. That's not ideal. We all know that. But I'm just telling you, like, we were really successful in spite of our lack of marketing, just because we were great coaches. We cared about our people. We got them results and the community we built. So you yeah. start with that. And if you get that entrenched, man, if you add like marketing, now you're just throwing jet fuel on the fire. And that's what we did, you know, and it, yeah, so like, if sure. you get yourself out now and you, and you built to have the money to do that. Now, you, like you said, you throw gasoline on the fire and you, you do the paid marketing as well. Yep. And uh, that's, that's helped us a ton now because we have deep community relationships and we can throw more at marketing than most, you know, gyms are willing to do. Absolutely. All right, my guy, last but not least, what's yep. next for Andy McCloy? What are you working on? What are you excited about? Other well, you got to go appraise this building, right? Yeah, I mean the next thing, and uh, you know, I, I I keep wanting to say I can't jinx it, but that just shows you how worried <laughs> that I am something could fall through. But right, uh, I mean, next is I want to I want to do again dominate my community, and there's a couple cities that are within arm's reach of where I'm at that are growing rapidly because of how big this community has grown. Yep. And I've got an opportunity to buy a, a building. It's an 11,000 square foot building. And there's an existing baseball pitching hitting business in it that I would acquire as well. So we would create a new facility. It would be for athletes and adults, but it would be heavily leaning towards baseball, softball. Um, I'll install an operator on the baseball side as long as that goes well. Um, and if it doesn't, we'll, we'll shut it down and we'll, we'll build a, a bigger gym. Yeah. <laughs> but, but right now, that's what we're going to do. And uh, you know, kind of the mission for me is to buy that building, um, use another asset, a gym, to pay off that building, and then repeat that. Come back here to Madison, get a building here, then maybe go Huntsville, Florence, some other cities around here as well. That's it. Um, because I, I want to, I really want to own the real estate. That's the, that's the end game, you know, yeah. really. Yeah. That's awesome, dude. I'm yeah. so excited for you, man. Got awesome things going on. I just love where you're at. And always, always great catching up with you. For sure. For the people that are listening, where can they find out more about you? Um, the Instagram and Facebook I'm on. I'm not on as much as a lot of people. I catch myself getting distracted and I consume yes. more than I create, which I don't really <laughs> like. Yeah. But uh, if you want to reach out to me, um, Instagram's good, Andy McCloy underscore BCI, uh, or on Facebook, Andy McCloy. Um, those are the easiest ways to get a hold of me. That's perfect. I'll get the links in the show notes. So if you're listening, yep. find Andy there. And again, my guy, thank you so much for your time, brother. I appreciate it. Likewise, man. Really enjoyed this. Thank you.